seated. And let's, uh, let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Father God, uh, we lift up to you this morning, um, you who holds the nations and the peoples in your hand, uh, the country of, of Belarus. Um, we thank you, Father, for the growth in your church, your true church, those who believe and have faith and hold to the historic convictions of the gospel. And we pray for that small minority to have boldness despite the political intolerance toward the free exercise of religion. We pray, Father, for uh, religious freedom in Belarus. But we pray, Father, that the lack of religious freedom there would be no hindrance to your good news going forth. And we pray that it would not be a hindrance to the faithfulness of your saints there. As time and time again, your power by your Spirit has proven that the gates of hell can not stand against your kingdom. We pray for those churches meeting in homes in Belarus, maybe even right this moment, Sunday evening there, because they are not allowed to gather publicly or in any sort of sizable numbers around the confession of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we pray that they would have confidence and courage in their Savior. We pray, Father, for some flexibility and freedom from the government there to allow missionaries in, but uh, lacking that, Father, we pray that your saints there, their, your church there, would be strengthened, that they would step up the work of evangelism and missions and discipleship and, and training the next generation of Christians, the next generation of pastors, that um, though they might not have the, the resources and the, uh, that outside missionaries might be able to bring to them and the years of experience they might be able to bring to them, that nonetheless you would bless them and strengthen them for that task, that they might prepare the next generation of leaders well. And would you start a gospel movement you are already in the <laughs> you already have a gospel movement there god who are we kidding but would you burn that gospel movement through uh, belarus and ignite it throughout that former soviet bloc father we pray for the uh curaya of uh, brazil and uh, father we uh, know so little about this people they are so small in number um, we pray for their protection we know uh, we have heard uh, that uh, they have been um, harmed by outside groups over the 20th century and they have uh, come into very small numbers we thank you God that a number of them over the centuries have come to profess some sort of faith in Jesus Christ. Um, we pray, Father, for a relaxation of the restrictions by Brazil on proclaiming the gospel to these tribes, to these people, that they might hear the good news of Jesus, that they might repent, that they might believe. We pray for those who have the Bible, who hold it in their hands, who attend a service, though they are particularly small in number, that they might have a revival in their hearts to bring the good news to the fellow members of their tribe. We pray for the chiefs of that tribe, that they might be converted and that their influence might allow 
for the further spread of your gospel. God, may your gospel take root in our hearts and may it burn bright in us that our lives and our homes and our workplaces might be missionary movements as well. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, turn to 1 Samuel 23. We're going to be in the back half of that chapter this morning, or swipe tap what you do to navigate to a passage of the Bible. There are Bibles in the chairs in front of you. If you don't have one, there's a table of contents in the front of that. It'll tell you right where 1 Samuel is, and uh, no shame in using that. 1 Samuel chapter 23. We're making our way through this book of 1 Samuel, and uh, we're going to read along and uh, just have it open. Check and see if what I say is, is what's here. As we believe at Gateway that this is God's word to us. And I'm more interested in explaining to you God's word than telling you Chris's words. So here's what God says. Then the Excuse me, I was starting in verse 19. Uh, Verse 15, David saw that Saul had come out to seek his life. David was in the wilderness of Ziph at Horesh. And Jonathan, Saul's son, rose and went to David at Horesh and strengthened his hand in God. And he said to him, do not fear, for the hand of Saul, my father, shall not find you. You shall be king over Israel, and I shall be next to you. Saul, my father also knows this. And the two of them made a covenant before the Lord. David remained at Horesh, and Jonathan went home. Then the Ziphites went up to Saul at Gebeah, saying, Is not David hiding among us in the strongholds at Horesh on the hill of Hakalah, which is south of Yeshimon? Now come down, O king, according to all your heart's desire to come down, and our part shall be to surrender him into the king's hand. And Saul said, may you be blessed by the Lord, for you have had compassion on me. Go make yet more sure. Know and see the place where his foot is, and who has seen him there? For it is told to me that he is very cunning. See, therefore, and take note of all the lurking places where he hides, and come back to me with sure information. Then I will go with you. And if he is in the land... I will search him out among all the thousands of Judah. And they arose and went to Ziph ahead of Saul. Now David and his men were in the wilderness of Maon, in the Arabah, to the south of Yeshimon. And Saul and his men went to seek him. And David was told, so he went down to the rock and lived in the wilderness of Maon. And when Saul heard that, he pursued after David in the wilderness of Maon, Saul went on one side of the mountain, and David and his men on the other side of the mountain, and David was hurrying to get away from Saul. As Saul and his men were closing in on David and his men to capture them, a messenger came to Saul, saying, Hurry and come, for the Philistines have made a raid against the land. So Saul returned from pursuing after David and went against the Philistines. Therefore, that place was called the Rock of Escape. And David went up from there and lived in the strongholds of En Gedi. What does strength look like? Is it enduring enormous pain without crying? Is it in surviving a round of hot ones without reaching for the milk? Is it Uh, big muscles and the ability to go toe-to-toe in the octagon. Uh, Maybe it's mental toughness, an ability to to steal your will and grit your teeth to accomplish any task or goal that's in front of you. Maybe it's never backing down, never giving up, no matter how hard or what the odds are or what cost, the will to win. How do you define Strength. In 1 Samuel 23, 15 through 29, we encounter the story of a man who needed strength, who got it, 
And it looked, I think, surprisingly different from what the world tells us strength should be. So we're going to look at David's relationship with strength through the lenses of acquisition and exhibition. Acquisition and exhibition. The passage begins where we left off last week. David saw that Saul had come out to seek his life. David was in the wilderness of Ziph at Horesh. So at the beginning of chapter 23, where we left off last week, David believed Saul was going to try to harm him because of a rumor he had heard. And he asked God whether that rumor was true. God told him it was true. And as a result, he fled the city he was in, and he later escaped to the regions east of Ziph. Then King Saul did go looking for him, and David now has learned God told him the truth. God had been right. The rumor had been right. Saul did come out to seek his life. So he's at Horesh, which is a place that's lost to history. We don't know where that is, but it's somewhere in that wilderness, somewhere in that desert. And remember, this the whole region is, is it's a high and rocky desert that cut, is cut up by dry riverbeds called wadis. And, and many of the rocky heights provided natural defenses against threats like an army. And so it was probably a very uncomfortable way of life. There were probably many miserable days for David and his men. And even today, not many people live in this area, but this remote, hostile location and high ground made it a relatively safe place for men on the run. Still, word that his life was, in fact, in jeopardy had to be disturbing. At the top of chapter 23, David had rescued an Israelite city called Keilah, from a Philistine raid. He had risked his life and the lives of his small army, these 400 men, now 600 men. And yet, even in doing the right thing, the good thing, he was closer than ever to the one person he was trying so desperately to stay away from, King Saul. It seems like he can't win. It seems like things just don't go right for David. And that's when we read, and Jonathan, Saul's son, rose and went to David at Horesh and strengthened his hand in God. The son of King Saul, you might remember from several chapters ago, was a close friend of David. They had parted company after Jonathan realized that his father really did want to kill David, a fact that he had initially been reluctant to believe. But he protected David, and he helped David to escape. And although the text doesn't say so explicitly, it's likely that Jonathan had been at Keilah looking for David with his father. And that's probably where he was when he came to look for David. It said that Saul gathered the whole army of Israel to go down to Keilah looking for David, and Jonathan was one of his top Uh, soldiers, one of his top army officials. And so it proves Jonathan's loyalty that he knows David's location, but his father, the king, does not. This ancient Hebrew expression, strengthen the hand, means something like to encourage. But it was used particularly when, when someone was feeling weak or feeble or timid or scared or, or needed to be emotionally or psychologically strengthened in many cases for a specific task, good or bad. We'll talk about that more in a second. And, and, and that's the tell here that David is feeling weak. The fact that he needed his hand strengthened tells us that on some level he's unsure of himself or he's feeling unprepared or he's otherwise lacking the toughness that he needs in this moment. 
And that Jonathan came to encourage David is an amazing thing because he travels some 10 or 20 miles over rugged terrain by foot or by beast of burden just to encourage his friend. And it was probably a risky move because if his dad finds out, that could be the end of his own life. But Jonathan doesn't just encourage David. He encourages him in God. That's what the text says. Strengthened his hand in God. There's a lot of encouragement we can give people. Some of it great. Some of it okay. Some of it not so great. But there is no encouragement better than encouragement in God. What does that mean to encourage someone or strengthen their hand in God? I think it means, and I'm basing this on the whole breadth of Scripture, Genesis to Revelation, and I, and I can't, I don't have the time to, to, to fully defend this here this morning, But I think it means that we, we help someone to savor the beauty of who God is and feast on the marrow of what God has done and be glad with the wine of what God has promised. Okay, that's a, a little poetic, I know. But, but I, I, I want you to, f- to feel it a little bit with, with your senses. And when you want to encourage yourself, you want to do the same thing. When you want to be a good friend and you want to encourage your friend, you want to help him or her to do this, to savor the beauty of God, of who God is, to feast on the marrow of what God has done and to be glad with the wine of what God has promised. You savor the the beauty of who God is. You you, you dig into God's word. You dig into God and who he is. You remind yourself or you remind your friend of who he is and what he's like. And how do you know what he's like? You, You don't just get it off the internet. You don't find it embroidered on a pillow. You dig into his word. And, and, And you point your heart to a myriad of places, but places like Exodus 34. The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. We point our hearts to places like Matthew 11 where Jesus speaks of himself and calls to us, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We remember passages like Isaiah's vision of the the heavenly throne in Isaiah chapter 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. And with two, he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy. Holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts." 
Or we point ourselves to John's vision of the exalted Jesus in Revelation chapter 1, where John writes, Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white like wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not. I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. He, God, is absolutely beautiful. He is absolutely magnificent. We feast on what he's done by remembering his great acts of old. The ancient Israelites did that routinely. And they especially remembered God's work in creation and God's work in delivering his people, the Israelites, from the oppression of Egypt. And both of those themes are, are combined famously in Psalm 136. Give thanks to the Lord of lords, to him who alone does great wonders, to him who by understanding made the heavens, to him who spread out the earth above the waters, to him who made the great lights the sun to rule over the day, the moon and stars to rule over the night. To him who struck down the firstborn of Egypt and brought Israel out from among them with a strong hand and an outstretched arm. To him who divided the Red Sea in two and made Israel pass through the midst of it, but overthrew Pharaoh and his host in the Red Sea. To him who led his people through the wilderness for his steadfast love endures forever. And so it goes on. And we Christians, we have continued to recount the great works of God. And we remember like we're going to remember this morning as Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 11, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do it in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying that this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so we remember that, that Jesus died for our sins and is coming again to judge the living and the dead. And that's the third thing. We make ourselves glad on the promises of God because God is true and because his word is good, we can trust his promises. He has routinely kept his word. The promises he made to the ancient Israelites, he kept to us. The promises he made to us, he will keep. And chief among those for us is that the king himself, Jesus, will return. And he will set this world in order to judge the living and the dead, the greatest and the least, the strong and the weak. And he will make all things new. These are promises of drunken joy. And that is precisely what I think Jonathan was doing for David. Now, he didn't have as much revelation as us. 
a couple of thousand years on. He didn't have as much knowledge of God as we have access to. But he had enough. We do not know the full scope of Jonathan's encouragement, but we do know that he pointed, back, uh, he pointed David back to one promise of God, that David himself would be king. And that meant that his father, Saul, would not find David, at least not in any meaningful way to harm him. David's life must go on if God's promises were going to prove to be true. And God's promises always prove to be true. Jonathan also encourages him, I shall be next to you. Maybe a better way to phrase that is, I will be second in command to you. And so Jonathan, the king's son, the heir apparent to the throne, is giving up any claim to the throne and humbly placing himself in David's loyal service. It's a sign of unwavering faithfulness and support, but it also says to David, I believe God's promises. They're trustworthy. They're good. I believe God's promises so much that I even believe them when I know that it means that as far as the world is concerned, it causes me harm. Because if, if God's promises are false, I'm king. Right? That, that's Jonathan's situation. If God's promises are false, then Jonathan is be, going to become king. But if God's promises are true, the most he can hope for is to be David's second command. That's how much Jonathan trusts in God's promises. That he believes God's promises even when it means he will not receive glory. Even when he will not receive the accolade. Even when he will not get the title. That's an encouragement, right? Of course, belief is not the same thing as faith. Belief and faith are not quite the same thing. Because his father, Saul, Jonathan says, also knows this to be true. And yet his father is trying to kill David. Why? Because ultimately, Saul does not have his heart set on the things of God. Jonathan does. Saul believes God's promises will come true, but he wants to have nothing to do with it. And if there's any possible way that he can disrupt that from coming true, he's going to do it. He's double-minded. There's a part of him that knows that this is what's going to happen, but there's a part of him that's going to fight against it anyway. And that's the difference between belief and faith. Do you trust the one that you say you believe in? You say you believe Jesus. Do you trust him? Because if you trust him, you'll follow where he's going. Then in verse 18, we read that they made a covenant. The closest analogy we have to a covenant would probably be like a contract or a treaty, but this is a lot weightier. And this is the third covenant between Jonathan and David. And, and while the exact terms of this covenant are not spelled out, we have to imagine it has something to do with what Jonathan just said. He will be David's loyal friend and one day, presumably, his subject. That's the role that Jonathan is taking on. I am under you. So this is how David acquired strength. He didn't do it by tending sheep or fighting lions, though he had done those things as a young shepherd. He didn't do it by fighting battles, though he had done that many times before. He didn't acquire strength by depriving himself of some good thing to toughen himself up. He acquired strength by the loving intervention of a friend who pointed him back 
to the God he served. For the faithful, for the Christian, our strength is rooted in God himself. Ultimately, that's where it needs to be. It needs to be rooted in God himself. It is the greatest source of our strength. It is where we will acquire the best of our strength is in God himself. Savoring his beauty. Feasting on the marrow of what he's done. And drinking the wine of his promises. Well, this leads into the episode that David is going to need some strength for. And David certainly needed strength. He probably generally knew why he needed strength. He's been on the run for a while now. But he couldn't have known specifically how that would have worked itself out. How it worked out was almost treasonous. In verse 19 we learn that some Ziphites, some residents from the city of Ziph, traveled to the capital of Gibeah to tell Saul that they knew where David was. David was hiding out in the area around Ziph, so that checks out. But this was the area of David's tribe, his people. And he was in that region, no doubt, because he expected some degree of loyalty and safety in those parts. But here, some of his own people are ratting him out to Saul. In fact, they don't just know that he's in the area. They know his exact location, the hill of Hakilah, which is south of Yeshimon, which, again, are more places that have been lost to history in that desert, but They have been scouting David for a bit. Saul always seems to do a good job of pretending to be religious, and so he invokes God's name. May you be blessed by the Lord, for you have had compassion on me. He's such a poser. But he wants even more specific information than what they've provided and maybe that's because the last time that, David, or that Saul found out where David was when he was at Kalah, he got away. Maybe he was a bit embarrassed by that. He certainly spent and wasted a lot of resources trying to track David down and come away empty-handed. He probably doesn't want really to go through that again. So he wants to know anyone who might have seen David, any place that he might visit on the regular, Basically, he wants to be prepared so that if David tries to escape, he knows exactly how to pursue him. And the men of Ziph are happy to oblige. And so in verse 24, we learn that David is now in the wilderness of Maon, in the Arabah to the south of Yeshimon. And and that's the same basic area as before. Again, wilderness is more like a desert. And and both Ziph and Maon are are towns on the edge of that desert. And it probably just refers to the desert region just outside each of those towns, uh, Mayon or Moan. Mayon was about four and a half miles due south of Ziph. And so the desert of Ziph is you know, here, the desert of Mayon is here. But just like Saul had informants, David must have had some too, because we read David was told. So we went down to the rock and lived in the wilderness of Maon. And Saul hears about that too. And, and this brings about, it's very brief, but if you, if you dig into it, this is really one of the most tense scenes, certainly in 1 Samuel, uh, and maybe one of the most tense scenes in the entire Bible. Uh, the description of events led one Judaic scholar to conclude that these things took place almost certainly at the knife-like Mount Holod. Uh, which is a, a, a ridge on the border territory that's, that's held between Israel and, and the disputed West Bank. And, and if you pull up a picture of it, uh, you can immediately imagine 
how David's men could clearly get caught on one side of this rocky formation and how Saul, in hot pursuit, might split off a battalion of men around the other side to try to cut him off and leave him surrounded. And so it's a game of cat and mouse, and by all accounts, David's time is up. The way this story is often described, though, when it is described, it is one of David fearfully fleeing from Saul. But that doesn't seem quite right. David isn't fearfully fleeing from Saul. We know that because we just read that Jonathan strengthened David's hand. He didn't try to strengthen David's hand. It says he did strengthen David's hand. The result of that phrase is always strength of courage in the Bible. There's another take on this encounter. I I, I read from one scholar. A very different take on this encounter. In this take, David, who is Saul's lauded and heralded soldier and strategist, is holding the high ground in the desert on terrain that he chose and was familiar to him and was in a position to win a victory over Saul, but chose not to take it. That's an interesting take, but I don't, I don't buy that either because the story just it drips with drama, and that drama would all be lost if we were to assume that this is a victory for David. Now, I think David's, apart from God, David... David's life is on the line here. I think the truth is somewhere else, somewhere in between. I think David believes, because of Jonathan's intervention, he remembers and he believes and he has dug into God's promise that he'll be king. But I think he also knows What Moses taught the Israelites and what his descendant would one day remind Satan, what Jesus would one day remind Satan, maybe not coincidentally in the wilderness, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. You might remember that when Satan tried to tempt Jesus in the wilderness with God's promises, Satan took Jesus to the top of the temple in Jerusalem and reminded Jesus, I paraphrase, that didn't God say that he wouldn't let any harm come to you? So why don't you throw yourself off the temple and prove it? You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. David might have reasoned in the same way. Didn't God say you were going to be king? Just go meet Saul face to face and dare him to harm you. What can Saul do to you? You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. We also saw in David's rescue of the the city of Calah and his defeat of Goliath that he loved his people. He loved the Israelites, God's people, and I don't think he was particularly interested in a civil war with Saul. Even if God saved his life, would God save the lives of his men? Would God save the lives of Saul's men? David has been persecuted by Saul. And on multiple occasions, Saul has tried to take David's life. On three occasions now, Saul has tried to hunt him down. Saul has even put David's own family in jeopardy so much that David felt the need to send his parents to a different country. Saul has forced David to live in caves and forests and now a desert. This is the David who had fought valiantly for his country, who had humbly served King Saul, who had married Saul's daughter and was his son's close friend. David was a man who must have felt deeply betrayed. And it's true that he had an army and he was on familiar terrain and he had a defensible position in the desert. But while it goes too far to say that David was in a position of strength, there are many men and women 
who in David's shoes, I think would have had just one thing in mind. Vengeance. Revenge. I want a pound of flesh. But not David. So what did Jonathan do? What did Jonathan accomplish? He strengthened David's hand. But to do what? Because here's how that language is used in the Bible. It, 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 oh, it's only used a few times, but it's enough for us to understand what it means. In the book of Judges, when Gideon's hand was strengthened, he had the courage to fight the Midianites despite overwhelming odds. Sounds familiar. And in that same book, when Abimelech's hands were strengthened, it gave him the strength and opportunity to kill his brothers and seize power for himself. It was evil, but it took fortitude, it took backing. In 2 Samuel, an associate of David's son, Absalom, gives him advice on a not family-friendly action that he could take to strengthen the hand of others so that he would believe that he has the right to usurp authority from his dad. It's another evil act, but it's one that took fortitude and boldness. Twice, uh, Nehemiah speaks of hands being strengthened. And once he speaks of the Israelites face, uh, needing the courage to continue to build the wall of Jerusalem despite threats of violence from outsiders against them. And another time he prays to God for the courage to continue the work. The prophet Jeremiah complained about false prophets in Jerusalem who, because they spoke falsely about God and turned a blind eye to sin, gave people a false confidence, strengthened their hand to lie and to commit adultery and to do all kinds of evils without any consequences. So that was another type of wicked boldness, but it was a boldness that led to action. So what about David? David's hand was strengthened in God and he ran away. That hardly sounds like the bold fortitude that we might expect from a person whose hand has been strengthened. Except that I think that's because our perception of what strength is has been skewed. And of all the people whose hand was strengthened in Scripture, the only one that we read their hand was strengthened in God was David. I think our perception of what strength is has been skewed. Toward the end of his life, the prophet Moses taught the Israelites a song, and he warned them that days were coming when they would turn their backs on God and their unfaithfulness would be their downfall. And the book of 1 Samuel is really about the culmination of one of the darkest such periods of Israel. And it looks like they're, as a nation, heading headlong into Moses's prophecy. And Saul has become one of the darkest figures of that time. And in this song that Moses teaches them, in this poem, he's, he speaks in the first person for God, vengeance is mine. You've probably heard that. It's a, it's a famous verse. But there's more. Vengeance is mine and recompense for the time when their foot shall slip, for the day of their calamity is at hand and their doom 
comes swiftly. From a human standpoint, from a worldly standpoint, David had every right to seek vengeance. He had been harmed in every conceivable way that you can imagine. But spiritually, spiritually, I think he knew that vengeance belonged to the Lord. And he could trust the Lord that the day of calamity was at hand. Saul's foot would slip. His doom would come swiftly. But that was not David's fight. And so David had the strength to lay down his arms and walk away. The greatest military strategist and soldier in Israelite history, David the warrior, David the champion, David who killed Goliath, had the strength not to fight. Another famous Bible verse, Psalm uh, 46, says, come, home, come behold... Uh, um, well, let me, let me get, get to that part. It says, the part you might see on the pillow is, be still and know that I am God. And it's a beautiful sentiment. But it's a more striking sentiment when you, when you read it in its context, which we sometimes sing, uh, come behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. In context, God is the warrior God who brings peace on the earth by absolutely destroying the violent, the wicked, the unjust. We can be still because we trust that he is fighting for us. We can be still because we can trust that he is our protection. David can leave the strongholds of the desert because he knows that God is his fortress. For the faithful, God is both their offense and their defense. And so they can be still. It is a special type of strength, a strength that is uniquely in God that allows us to lay down our arms to be still. To trust that God will fight the battle and the victory belongs to him and him alone. Strength in the Lord allows us to let go of our battles. Strength in the Lord allows us to let go of our battles. That is how David exhibited strength. Strength in the Lord allows us to let go of injustices committed against us, to let go of grudges, to let go of pains and wrongs and hurts and scars. It allows us to say, I don't have to fix this. I don't have to win this. I don't have to correct this. I don't have to make this right. Because there is a God who fixes. And there is a God who wins. And there is a God who corrects. And there is a God who makes right. Who heals. Who soothes 
and who promises that he will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. And the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. And his promises are sure. His promises are true. And his promises strengthen the hand of his faithful ones. Let's pray. Father, would we be a people who is strengthened not as the world sees strength, but be strengthened in you. To know that you are our victor and our champion and our fighter and our warrior. You are our offense and our defense. You are our fortress. You are our safe and good hiding place. And you are our sword and shield. Give us the strength as we know you have promised to lay down our fights in this world and trust your promises because your promises are so good and we know that they are true. And we pray for those who've yet to come to trust in those promises that their beauty would be attractive, would be interesting, would stoke their curiosity. That they would want to get in on your good promises as well. It's in the name of Christ, the one you promised and proved faithful to send us and who we know is returning our great and blessed hope that we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing about his promises. <laughs>